Facebook, but we have our backup going right now. <laughs> and uh, hello, welcome to the weekly Bach and Get Together in Overtime Part 2 this week. In fact, it's a little bit more than the great Bach and Get Together. What it is, is it's uh, three programs in one, because as I've mentioned before, we got this great content relationship with Bakken.com, the crude life, Bakken.com, bringing you some original programming right here about the Bakken. And uh, what we're doing today is our weekly Bakken Get Together, because we're going to talk a little bit about the East-West connection and divide, and we'll get to that in just one second. But earlier in the week, we had uh, U.S. House Representative Ben Hansen on, and I'd like to thank Ben once again because he was one of six people who said, yes, I will come on and talk about this extremely controversial topic. The other person, Mr. Mike Marseille, who was out of town during the uh, timing, so it didn't match up, but this Friday it worked out just fine. And he said, you know what, let's talk about some of these other ideas that we got in the hopper too. One of them involves Maxwell's here where we're at, it's, it's, it's a restaurant. And so we're looking at uh, possibly doing some power lunch things, some high end, some CEOs, some business owners sitting down over, having a little break and a little bread, talking a little bit. And also, here's his, Mr. Marcel's brainchild, which brings us to where we're at. Because it's, it's Friday afternoon, folks. <laughs> hey, we got to kick ourselves. You know why? Because this is adult talk. And we're going we're gonna to kick back a little bit, and what we're going to talk about today, not everybody's going to get a trophy when they go home, because that's what adults do, but at the same time, we're not catastrophists, we're not sensationalists, so we feel pretty confident that we can have a civil conversation about some pretty important issues over a glass of wine on a Friday afternoon, and wine in the West, you're calling it? Wine in the West. Wine in the West, because what you folks don't know as far as our... 60,000 Facebook followers, 47,000 Marcellus followers, 50,000 Eagle Ford followers, Permian, Hainsford, Nile Brer adds up to 250,000 social media followers. Add that with our 30 radio stations plus newspapers and magazines. We got this sucker covered and now we're going to ask a little bit of a, a little bit of adult conversation here and we're bringing out the video portion so we got two video cameras set up. All right. Mike, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for joining uh, uh, us on the Bakken Get Together here. And uh, oh, quick plug, uh, tomorrow night, Friday? Come on oh, now. here's Ramon. Oh wait, today's Friday. Oh gosh, I thought it was Thursday. So Friday, today, we haven't even really gotten into this, so we can't even get our days right here, but here's Ramon, owner proprietor of Maxwell's, and uh, appreciate him sponsoring today's program. And uh, what kind of wine are we drinking today? Well, right now you have our um, House wine. This is our uh, Molly Ducker, uh, the scooter, Merlot. south of Australia. So it's a beautiful Merlot that can be paired. Sorry if I started to talk about food, but if you have mm. wine, it's Friday. Um, I can pair these very well with our Max Burger. So mm. it's a really nice option when you come to Maxwell's just to have this one by the glass, or just um, if you're visiting with your folks or your friends or co-workers, just it's a really good wine um, from Australia. Molly Ducker, the scooter. <laughs> it's a What's that special tonight? Tonight, well, um, everybody asks us what's the special. Everything is a special, of course. We should we should get in right now. Um, I think that we're gonna get Alaskan Hollywood. We oh, just got him. I haven't opened the box yet, but I think that we have Alaskan Hollywood for everybody tonight, Friday, December first, okay. two thousand seventeen. Another good oil state, Alaska. To Fifty <laughs> degree weather on December first. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Which is really nice. Awesome. Thank you and um, enjoy it. And cheers. It's All Friday. Right. Yeah, Thank yeah, you very yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Wine in the West. Yes. Western North Dakota. That's Ramon. We're here at Maxwell's in Fargo, North Dakota. And the reason we're here in Fargo is um, there was an article recently in the Wall Street Journal. Printed this out. And this was an issue that has been going on for a long time. And it needs to stop. It really needs to stop. And that's one of the reasons why I'm doing this program. Now, I've received a number of emails saying, you don't want to talk about this. It's too controversial. No, I'm saying there needs to be somebody that stands up and says, let's nip this in the bud before it gets too far. Now, what am I talking about here? Well, in the very last line of this Wall Street Journal article that is titled as Money Titans, an oil boom town fights for its share. So right away, the headline grabs you, conflict. We're fighting. There's a fight going on in North Dakota and it's over oil. Now keep in mind, blood and oil, right? That's what has been talked about over the last five years. So much so ABC did a sit or did a not a sitcom. It kind of was a sitcom because I think it was shot in I Utah. Think it, was uh, it was canceled. 
mountains but, in the background. By the way. Yeah, the I know. That's what I mean. Mountains were in the background. In fact, they did call me. I was going to do <laughs> some consulting work for them if it got picked up more than five episodes, and because uh, they got so much, so much uh, backlash because of the mountains in the That's background. Terrible. A uh, friend of mine works in Hollywood, and so they called me and said, hey, if this thing gets picked up, would you come out to the Bakken and consult with us? I said, well, absolutely I will. You're Hollywood. So, uh, okay, the last line in the Wall Street Journal article, what should we do? Just send, just work and send taxes back east. What that says is that the east-west friction is now national in the Wall Street Journal. The inner bickering has started. So representative, I'm sorry, uh, uh, U.S. House Representative uh, candidate Ben Hansen came on to talk about that because he's got family from Crosby. He knows the guy who, he's got family in Castleton who unhooked the, the train derailment, so he's very attached to the energy industry. So when we talked, we've been talking five years about the East-West thing, he's a pretty passionate guy about it, and I brought him on. The first thing I said was, um, well, good for you because U.S. Congressman Kramer, that guy doesn't turn down anybody. And he doesn't. He's, no. he's very accessible, and you need to be as a politician. So uh, kudos to that. We did receive a, a, a kind of a, uh, a nasty uh, uh, Facebook message because we decided to bring someone on that knew what they were talking about. So because somebody didn't like his politics, they left us uh, kind of a nasty message. But you know what? Who cares? Because we don't really get into politics here. We like to be adults. We like to have civil conversations. We like to talk about some uh, tough issues. And the one that we're going to talk about today is the East-West Divide. Historically speaking, my understanding is, is that if you drew a line through Jamestown, north and south, Jamestown, North Dakota, and went east, that was where the political power was. Now I've been told it's even a little bit further, which is Valley City. Okay, so now you're talking 45 minutes. Meaning the eastern side of the state is getting a little bit more political power. People down in Texas, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, you've got Dallas, you've got Houston, you've got pockets that have got some power, and you've got oil country that sometimes is pretty desolate outside of some little pocketed areas, but Texas understands how important oil and gas is. And that's what we're here today to talk about, is how important oil and gas is to the state of North Dakota. There is a lot of companies in Fargo, and a lot of companies in Grand Forks that are relying on Western North Dakota. And I'm not talking about the state government, which has like 20 to 30% of its budget tied to their, no. I'm talking about private companies that have a lot riding on this industry that's going to be around for 30 years, a new industry. Uh, interviewing Lynn Helms on Sunday, we're going to talk about the new industry. So just a little preview there. Mike, okay, what is your knowledge of the north-south a little bit, or the east-west when it comes to the friction now? It's been called sodbusters versus ranchers. It's been called uh, ag versus oil. Um, Personally, I think it's just got to stop, and we got to understand that it all works together. Well, I think I think historically, Jason, before the oil boom really kicked off in this cycle, the politic of North Dakota was was really the following: it was east versus west, not you know east versus west. There were a lot of different divergent interests. It was rural fighting with urban for resources, and everybody hates farming. So the, 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 the funny thing about that is, I think that, that that was so much more pronounced outside of Cass County when we grew up, because we grew up in the 80s and, and he went to Fargo North, I went to Fargo South. We didn't have a perception about the rest of the state, and, but people outside of this area really did. And a lot of it had to do with resource allocation, a lot of it had to do with some pride, a lot of it had to do with they didn't feel like they were getting heard, you know, with policymakers. Um, the, the reality of it is it, it's long standing, it goes way back. Um, actually, I, I, at this point I was going to just say, um, I, was, I was reading uh, some, some news releases and I had heard about the Blue Book, we have it right here, but I had never ordered one. And the Historic Society has these available on their website. And the Blue Book, North Dakota Blue Book, has 650 pages of every conceivable fact about North Dakota. And what's interesting about it is this year the Historic Society did a section on World War I. We're at the 100 year anniversary of the conclusion of World War I. And North Dakota, you know, growing up with a, a, a grandmother who's from um, Stanton, North Dakota, and who's a German from Russia, we didn't talk a lot about it. 
But what's really interesting is there's some historical context back to World War I that gives a lot of knowledge and context 100 years later in North Dakota. Um, some of it had to do with cultural, a lot of it was economic, just the way they set up the university, the prisons, the state hospital. So there was always a fight for resources. And um, this state has always been a federal entitlement state. So for every dollar we would pay in taxes, we'd get $2 back federally. And so it drove our culture for 100 years in terms of that relationship between the federal government and state and local governments. That changed a lot in this cycle with the oil boom because really the boom was driven by private industry, Wall Street, and a different type of commodity play that didn't rely on the federal government putting programs like you know the, the power plants in or you know the gasification plant or the garrison dam. It had to do with private industry that didn't require policymakers in the beginning authorizing or doing a lot uh, to make that all occur. And so traditionally that policy, you know, kind of consensus, whether it was a Republican state with Democratic senators, everybody got on the same page when it came to getting resources to the state. Mm -hmm. I think that for the longest time when those resources came to the state, there was, there's always been a struggle legislatively in terms of allocation of resources, okay? And I think that, you know, having a, a dad and an uncle that are from Sherwood, North Dakota, they grew up, you know, northwest of Minot. Um, I grew up hearing a lot of the stories about just, you know, kind of what it was like to live and grow up in the 40s and 50s in western North Dakota. It was a lot tougher um, back then, and there just didn't have a lot of resources. A lot of us hear about the Great Depression and our grandparents and the struggles. So the east-west thing, I think, had a lot more to do with kind of like getting to the table and, and, and getting your fair share and, and, and a fairness doctrine in North Dakota. Um, when you and I grew up in, in this area, unless we were in sports, we wouldn't have a reason to go out to Williston. As a matter of fact, I had never been to Williston until I was 24 years old. Can you imagine that? I can. And, I can. And uh, outside of baseball tournament. Yeah, for sure. I, I hadn't gone back until the oil boom. Right. And so, yeah. you know, you think about that. So we, it's not that we had a, a bad context of what, we just didn't have a context. There, there really wasn't a lot of news coming out. We didn't really have a lot of friends from them. Once we got to college, we met different people from the western side of the state. This area was so much more defined in the Red River Valley by Minneapolis that we paid a lot more attention to things that were occurring in Minnesota. A lot of us spent our summers in Minnesota. And we didn't look west, we really looked east. And we looked at the competition and, and a lot of our supply chain that came from Minneapolis and there was tensions to that. But the folks in western North Dakota also went to Minneapolis and they drove through Fargo. Mm -hmm. So they would drive through during tough economic times. And you talk to people, they'd be like, hey, you know, we drove through Cass County and they had all this rich farmland and they made all this money and they didn't care about us out west. Right. They, didn't, they didn't have empathy. It's not fair that they're not sharing. That is our Norwegian, German, sort of like the fairness doctrine. If somebody has more, they should want to share more. And I think it comes down to that simple fact uh, to a lot of it. Um, I, I, I will be very positive about something is we have this quarterback in in uh, in uh, Philadelphia, and I was thinking about that this morning. I said, you know, talk about the most unifying figure between East and West in, in North Dakota history is Carson Wentz, because everybody in Fargo is proud of his Bismarck runs, mm -hmm. and everybody in Bismarck now is proud of NDSU. And I remember growing up, they hated NDSU. Yeah, they did. And uh, you know, I'm a former UND guy, but I'm an NDSU fan too. Uh, but we all are proud of a North Dakotan and that tough Western work ethic, right? And we take great pride as North Dakotans. It was a unifying factor. And to your point that you're just talking about earlier, we're in this state have lived through 100 years of tough times. Mm -hmm. We lived through the Great Depression. We lived through commodities booms and ag busts and depopulation. Uh, Mary is sitting over there. I, I said, in, as recently as 2004, I had 53 county map in my office. And there was purple and green. And in 2014, 50 counties were depopulating. Three were green. It was Burley, Grand Forks, and Cass. 
and to think about the struggle of that, and, and you've got some good topics about sales tax and correlating sales tax to population, and that's probably another show. But when you're losing your population and you're fighting for resources, and you feel like there's, there's a lack of hope sometimes in rural communities, that when this boom came around and the West stood up in a way, and for the first time we're able to say, no, we're contributing more than Cass County. We're contributing more than the universities. We deserve our fair share because forever we didn't. And the funny thing about this is there's a different crew of people, but it's the same feelings. But it's for different reasons. And But it, it goes back to a deep-seated, you know, kind of a cultural thing in North Dakota about fairness. The fairness of doing the right thing, being a good neighbor, helping the guy build his barn, or he gets self sick and helping farm his land and that's who we are that would be the epitome of like a Carson Wentz where they're like here this guy is like such a good man and he's a good moral man and, and it, it, it's like a, a good man from the 1950s I would say you know if you want to go back to uh, you know Hazian area just come up just come up to western North Dakota and some of these rural towns and in, in North Dakota in general and it's a it's a time capsule in terms of doing the right thing so I I, I, I I think that's a unifying factor. I think we should look for more unifying factors. But there are some really non-unifying things like flood protection. You know, it's tough to advocate for flood protection when we're in a drought again. We're in a drought, drought cycle. 1936, 7, you'll have to look at the blue book. Uh, the Red River ran dry. It would have been tough to advocate flood protection. So government sort of reactive, not as proactive. Um, those communities are in some resource issues right now. Well, let's talk and about so that's, that. Yeah, that's a challenge. So the, the government being reactive as opposed to proactive, um, one of the things that they tried to be proactive on was during the you know $100 oil. Yeah. They tried to be proactive and solve problems that didn't exist, okay? Not long-term problems. And so as this article comes out, money tightens, oil boom towns, fights for share, you know, you had the surge f fund money come, well the budget didn't quite make it to where they thought it was going to be, no. and so a lot of the company, a lot of the cities didn't get the money they wanted, or they were they thought they were going to get. They got cut back. They got cut back, okay. And so as I'm looking at some of this, you know, you got some of the finger pointing, the east and the west and all these other things. 2009, when that recession took off, or I'm sorry, when, when the $110 oil took off, the one thing that you want to take a step back and say that was a 2009 recession North Dakota was funding 48 other states the only other state that was really operating by itself is Texas because they had oil hmm. Alaska they have a socialized oil they've got government owned oil that's why they get a check for a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks or whatever it is every, every single year so talk to somebody who's dealt with Alaskan uh, oil it moves like molasses. It's really slow. That's why there's only two companies really that drill up in Alaska. So they, they they can reduce down the number of people in a room. So when I'm looking at this, what type of foresight did we have as elected officials and as state leaders to say 2009, we have a recession going on. We got all these people from all over the com country coming in. Maybe they're not going to stick around and stay. Yeah, but there was a policy delay, and as you remember, because really North Dakota works on a biennium. Okay, so every two years we set budgets and priorities, and and I, you know, I'll make this assertion is that the the front end of 08, 09, and 010 caught a lot of people off guard because Absolutely. it was really private industry that saw things that not even locals or policymakers definitely not. And they weren't going to the legislature asking for anything. They weren't demanding anything. They were just doing. So here's what happened. There was a lag with policies with what happened on the ground. And what, as a consequence, we went through three bienniums where there really wasn't much legislatively either allocated or even planned and there was a wait and see, I know, in the first two bienniums, and there was a little bit of a surplus in that first one, and they're like, it's not going to last. It was suspended disbelief. It wasn't until the fourth biennium that they said, oh, wow, okay, this is for real, this is going to last. It was about six years, seven years in. 
And that's when you saw things like property tax values going up. Remember, they're rear facing. We saw infrastructure needs. We saw communities that were afraid to go bond. We saw planning issues. We saw a lot of things that North Clinton hadn't dealt with ever. And I would say that unlike Alaska, that would have required, for example, like the Alaska pipeline, they had to do an act of Congress literally to get that through because of, of, you know, it was just so complicated. Um, in North Dakota, we were so business friendly and we were so laissez-faire passive, they just did it. And so by the time it blew up, every, it was just going and it was sort of like the, the train is moving, you're not going to stop the train, so how do you direct the train not to hit something? Mm -hmm. And so I would say the, the second half is when there was light foot policy when they started to do the first set of impact. And then they did the big one right at the right right at, right in fifteen when it started to the oil the commodity prices started to collapse. I would say we got lucky though, because we did build a lot of reserves. I've written about that for a long time. But those reserves have been pretty the, the emergency funds have been pretty well depleted. I mean we've got to kind of live hey as you go now. Um, there are some creative things they're doing with trust funds and things to direct some of the income, but we don't have extra billions of dollars to fix problems and. And, and I think that's going to be a challenge. I mean, there's going to be back to that resource fight. Um, I think it's going to be the same feelings of, hey, we deserve this. But you made a good point recently. You said, well, they made the decision to build the $70 million community center. That wasn't... Uh, I, I remember yeah. that debate. That was heavily debated. That was um, that was a big debate out there, whether it should be $50 million or $70 million. And um, the other one was the airport. What, should it be in Tioga? Should we relocate? Now, the Williston Airport... I'm talking about the minor one. Holy moly. The Williston Airport, they're, they're relocating it. I, um, and yeah. there's only four in the country's history that they've done. Like St. George, Utah is one of them. Because they had to go to... Stapleton. Sta I, okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I just remember St. George because I love St. George, Utah. Um, I'd like to retire there someday, possibly. Have a second home there, if you will. I was thinking um, Dilworth. Dilworth? Yeah. Dil Dilworth nice train. Nice. Maybe um, Grassy Butte. Oh, I love Grassy Butte. Grassy Butte. Spent on Can spent. I do my, my disaster cave there? Because I I'm, I'm totally want to do a proper shelter somewhere. Yeah. I think, I think that Grassy would, Butte would be right. You'd probably get in pretty no well. No zombies. Pretty well out there. So we're looking at these projects, okay? You've got, you know, the Williston Rec Center. You know, Dickinson built theirs before the boom. So some could argue there was some foresight there, okay? Yeah. Um, the the airport, you know, we got the Western Area Water Supply. Remember, a lot of the airports that was federal. I understand so you that. Gotta, I understand but then that. there's sort of like, how do you maintain the infrastructure once you have it? And I was just reading my nuts budget this week. There's some real cost to maintaining it. Mm -hmm. And there that's going to affect mills, and they have. And uh, Bismarck and Jamestown, <laughs> all these smaller airports, they're going to lose their federal funding well, pretty soon. The question is, do you, and all of a sudden, do you require essential services? The flights are going to go up. But, but what I'm getting at is that, okay, the Western Area Water Supply, there's that, there, that issue's not done yet because now the report comes out that 20 times the amount of water is going to be needed out in the Bakken. So that's going to create quite a whole new dialogue for the Western Area Water Supply. Also, if you take that historical, which is what $150 million it started at, now it's at $460 million. They don't have an end in sight. Look at the kerfuffle going on in Fargo. Yeah, it's a nightmare. Do you think that they're going to be looking for some state money at some point? I really think they're going to. Well, and it's a tough sell because it's not even a unified front in Fargo. No. And so you got to realize people that are, again, resource, you know, so in resources, they're th going to use that. Th that, by the way, is a legitimate concern by Western North Dakota. Oh, absolutely. That's a legitimate concern. Totally. The politicians are saying, oh, no, that ain't going to affect anything. Well, and Minnesota's Whoa, not even honky. on board. Minnesota's not on board. <laughs> you know, the like, DNR's not on board. Yeah. They've already... There is a group of there's guys. One, one guy who's 20, a that's on board. There's a, there's a group of guys <laughs> 20 miles south of town holding backyard barbecues that are beating the f penny funded sales tax people. Backyard barbecues are beating these guys, these, these government officials, and this, this whole diversion crew with a PR battle. Is that fair? Is that, yeah, is it that, is. Is that fair it, to well, say? The, 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 Okay. These, these poor guys Look, in Oxford, they run a backyard barbecue. When Danny Wallacher used to get out and save the city from the flood devastation, and we're going to top over with an inch, yep. you mobilize 100,000 people. The problem is, unless there's a, an actual, seen, perceived, real crisis, it's hard to mobilize people's interests, especially when it's their money. The second year, 
Sheriff Paul Laney had to get the inmates to Sandbag because everybody's like been there, done that. Right. Do you remember that? I do. I was there. It was it was unbelievable. But the biggest point the biggest point here is that there's a lot of very expensive projects going on. Big. And, and and we're talking water, which is a necessity. That's the big one. We're talking some infrastructure, which are necessities. So a lot of those dollars are tied to oil and gas. But you got to remember another thing, guys. As our prosperity increased, the federal dollar formulas, the higher your general income is, population, the more you lose federal funding. So the thing I hear about is a lot of elder care and Medicaid, Medicare, those kinds of things which are really unfunded mandates. Mm -hmm. And I think that in the legislature this year, they've had some requirements that they had to fund. They don't have a choice, they're mandated. And that's a big issue too. So it's not just energy or ag or water, but we've got this older population that we also, there's not as much federal money coming mm -hmm. in our direction because of our, our income. Well, that's where I was going with this, is that when you take a look at a lot of the federal dollars that came in, in the history, according to the Blue Book, Blue Book, a lot of the major projects were federally funded. Big time. Now, they're looking at, okay, the federal dollars may not be coming in, so now we got to look at the state, because when they bought a lot of the toys, and they committed to a lot of the toys, it was $110 oil. It was $90 oil. Well, then it went down really fast, and a lot of people were kind of like, uh-oh, now what do we do? Yeah, I don't think we ever really spent ahead of the curve, though. I mean, I'll be really pretty upfront about that. I think there, over the last 10 years, has been a natural tendency and conservative nature of the policymakers that, yeah, it is good times, but I never got a fork sense of, and you know, because you've, you've interviewed everybody, that they were out willy-nilly. I think to a certain extent there was the definition of the want versus the need. I think in a lot of communities, oh, especially right like you know Watford <clears throat> City, you had scenarios where um, they hadn't had many resources or they hadn't had water parks or schools, so they felt like they needed that, but other people might have defined a million square foot <laughs> rec center as a want, and so I think there was a gray area between want and need and then projected growth, and I think that was where we got in a little trouble. So a few things I, I, I understand, there, there was... We had to do this. What about the West East controversy? Huh? What about the West East controversy? Well, that's, that's we're talking. Oh, we're about. getting there. Okay. No, that's what we're talking about. Is that the want and the need and everything? Yeah. So, one of the things that we, you know, <laughs> like, okay, here's a, here's a story we did the American uh, evolution story on the Bach, and this is just some of the uh, places that we've been uh, published here with the crude life content, and um, here is another one here. Where are we at? The new normal, the Bach and infrastructure. Okay. Just to give you an idea that we are in quite how a few many, how different areas. Did you go? Uh, quite a few, actually. Actually, this is mostly petroleum-based. <laughs> For a digital company, we got all kinds of books and magazines and dead trees. Because we want to hit those people too, <laughs> you know. Not everybody is online these days, you know. I mean, Nobody uses Facebook. Like so here's an interesting one: Energy's newest landlord. This is a story that I wrote back in 2015. Did it? And oh yeah, it was in, it was published in a national magazine. <laughs> And it's talking about how uh, Stanley got in the, uh, the landlord business. They, oh, they, they, right. Yeah, they, they, the, the school district in Stanley bought apartments. Did they have to do that? Did they have to? Well, again, Did they have to outbid the privates? Well, but, but I, I know that project. and they, 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 that's, that's why they'll Mike's make here. the argument if, we didn't, if we, we didn't have it, we wouldn't get the teachers. And I deal with that today with, uh, with a, a group that we're talking in Tioga today. And it, it was like, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And so they made a decision. I know. We can't look back now and blame people for, I, for the most part, I think they make good decisions in 90% of the time. I mean, I honestly think this could have been such a bigger derailment if we wouldn't have had the policymakers we had in office at the time. Jack Dalrymple, to, uh, namely, comes to mind. Jack was very conservative, knew our budgets. Was, you know, he had a good way of massaging the financials, but I'm telling you, it wasn't like we were out there like 1985 or 88 and we're like, you know, eliminating uh, government departments because we were in such tough shot and shape. I honestly thought it would be a lot worse, Jason. I really did. 15 unit apartment building for almost 2 million. 1.975 million. Does that seem like a good price for a company? 15 units in Stanley, North Dakota for 2 million? It's about right. 
Okay. I, would, I wouldn't say that was overpriced at that time. Okay. Um, but that, that's that's what we're talking about is some different options that were done out there. And I think what we're getting at is not so much of the so are blaming. They sell the building, right? I have absolutely no yeah. idea. I, it's just that that was a. You know, I don't think they could. But what we're getting at is that instead of the blame game, saying, oh, we had to do this and point fingers, there was a time that none of us really knew what to do. We made a decision, and now we're sticking by our decision, and this is where we're at now. But don't you think we were playing on house money? I mean, here's the funny thing. We didn't have... I, I don't know. We didn't have anything for 100 years. Like, you go to small towns, like we're in Wahala, and, and they don't have anything, and all of a sudden, you know, Vinny and Tony from New York coming in and wanting to put a billion dollars in, they're like... Okay, let's do it. You know, like, what did they have to lose? This is my, my assertion. What did the people of North Dakota really have to lose on that whole, on any of those decisions? Because the bottom line is this, they put all this money and infrastructure out there, and I've talked to guys about this. Hey, if everything goes to heck, the infrastructure's still there. It's ours. Mm -hmm. It's like China lending me money. I think they should loan us $20 trillion. Good luck taking the Empire State Building. So. The bottom line is they're not going to take the infrastructure back to New York. They're just going to lose their money. They're going to lose their money. And guess who benefits? The people of North Dakota. Right. The challenge is that they were assessing the values of this and hiring state, city, workers, you know, teachers, medical professionals at Y. Now they're getting inverted. Now, I don't think we've seen the worst of that. I think mine not specifically. I think we've got a couple tough years ahead of us to, to level that thing out. And I'm concerned about depopulation again. I think that if we really look at the data, I don't think we're growing in any kind. So that's where I want to go next. I think we're depopulating. Uh, Mike Marcel, Jason Spies, this is the weekly Bach and Get Together. Um, part two this week because we're uh, trying out a couple new programs. Uh, one is called Wine oh, in the West. Sure, yes. And uh, the other one is, of course, a little bit of adult conversation here about some and things. I like it personally because a lot of the radio programs I do, I don't get too political because it's not the format for this. This is a little bit different. I, I'm, I'm pushing things along a little bit because they're, the thing about trying to stay ahead, of the, stay ahead of the curve is people think you're trying to be political when you're not. You're just trying to get some conversations going. You're trying to think. And with the East-West topic, we're trying to stay ahead of the curve before another outfit besides the Wall Street Journal starts talking about the civil war happening in North Dakota because the people out west are mad because the people out east are not going to give them money. Well, we, But that's, that's what I'm saying. That's I, I, think story. This, I think this is overblown. Okay. You think? I, yeah. But I, I'm just saying, look, it, it's like anything in the social reverberation chamber that gets made to be a lot of nothing. The bottom line is this. I talk to people every day, you do every day in our business, policymakers, mayors, uh, you know, people on the ground, they're unaware of a lot of this stuff. Like, they don't, like, I didn't know this was going on, and I mean, I'm out there. So how much of this is to create a topic for the sake of creating a topic that might have a little thread of truth to it, but in reality, so many of these issues just get worked out. You know, think about that. So many of them, mm -hmm. now, some would argue with Doug and uh, Governor Burgum with the transparency and the blood thing, I won't get into that. Um, that some of it's done in a little bit non-transparent way, which 